you. Thank you. Uh, it's been awesome so far. The morning, and I'm I'm really inspired and impressed. And I'm a little nervous now about my presentation to be up to what you guys have already done. And um, just to start off with a little introduction about myself. My name is Mark Cormier. Um, most of you know that. Um, and I, I work in, in in San Jose, Costa Rica, at the, the Binational Center. And I'm really excited to you know share some of my thinking and things that. Um, I do when I teach one of my students there. Um, Alejandro's going to help pass out some some handouts, which we'll be referencing during the, the talk. And um, without fur further ado, let's get started with it. So, the title of my presentation is Curiosity Driven Language Teaching, a charge map course. And we'll see um, what that reference is in just a moment. So, let's get started. Um, I want us to start by doing just a little kind of icebreaker here. You've had a moment to eat lunch. And there on the first page that you have, you have uh, two columns there. Just real quick, if you have a free hand or two, uh, I just want you to say, you know, count one, two, three with the person next to you, and then show a number with one of your hands. So from zero, one, two, three, up to five, right? And you're going to add your number that you show and the number that your partner shows. Mark has to take that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say one, two, three, and I'm just going to show some amount of fingers, okay? And if it's an even number of fingers, mine and yours, we're going to answer a question on the right side. And if it's an odd number of fingers, we're going to answer a question on the left. Still a puzzle, but I think you'll figure it out just as soon as we get started, right? So just for the person next to you, one, two, three, show a number of fingers, count them. If it's odd, answer one question. If it's even, answer another. Or answer any of the questions that, that jumps out at you. Because of time, we're going to have to compress it quite a bit here in the, in the workshop. But at least I wanted you to get you thinking about curiosity and critical thinking because these are two things that <laughs> really has been on, on my mind a lot um, regarding my teaching and, and learning. And so today, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to start by telling you a story. We're going to talk a little bit about curiosity, critical thinking, and science. We're going to also see what we can do time wise to demo a kind of sample lesson sequence. And then we'll uh, think about that in terms of critical thinking and in terms of planning a lesson with critical thinking and curiosity in mind. And we'll hopefully have time to wrap it all up. So let's get started with our story. The story takes place uh, where I live in Costa Rica in particular. I don't see it here in the city where I live. And it didn't happen to me, but it happened to a friend of mine, and she told me about it the same day that it happened. So I feel like I'm a part of the story. And it's just a really cool story, and I wish it happened to me. Uh, so um, let me tell you. And um, this is my friend. Her name is Laura Laura. And one day, she was leaving her house on her way to work, and something really interesting happened. 
we talk about stories, especially like you, you made me think about this, Anita. Um, but who's ownership of our stories and things like that. I don't know who I've shared this story with, if I've told you guys this somewhere last week, somewhere, if I never told you. So if I have told you, no, no, no spoilers, okay? Um, but this happened to my friend Laura, and I think it's really interesting. She was on her way to work, she was walking from her door across her front yard to her car, and she was halfway there. Something hit her on the head. She looked down, and this is what she saw. A fish was flopping on the ground at her feet in her front yard in Cartago, Costa Rica. And, of course, she was shocked by that. Why wouldn't she be? Even a little disgusted, right? And uh, above all, she was really curious, really puzzled about what had just happened. And she went to work and told me the story, and we talked about it for the rest of the day. And I'm still talking about it. Okay. So I want you to take a moment uh, with the person closest to you to think about what questions you have regarding this anecdote that I've just told you. Think of, I put two or three, but let's say one or two possible explanations for that thing that happened to her. And for each one, I'm going to give you about you know, two or three minutes here for each one. Think about what additional information you would like to know in order to evaluate that possibility. So if you think, this is the, the explanation. What else would you like to know in order to give more validation to that, that, that theory? And maybe you can even frame those in terms of questions. Right? So I'd like to know this. How can I make that into a question? And finally, if you have time, uh, what might you do if you were so inclined to find the answers to those questions that you posed? Okay? So take a moment. If you want, uh, at the bottom of that first sheet, there's a little graphic organizer. You can take some notes there. Otherwise, you can just talk. But just take a moment to, to, to do that with your client. Yeah. in her car, and she was leaving the neighborhood, and as she was approaching the entrance, exit, you know, area of the neighborhood, she saw, come on, there we go, another fish on the ground, in the middle of the street, flopping up and down, and she had no idea, uh, again, what was going on, and she would have no, uh, way of knowing the information I'm about to tell you, but that fish species is actually not even native to Costa Rica. It's a fish species native to you know, the liber uh, livers, <laughs> rivers and lake systems of, of Africa. So it's an African freshwater fish. Yeah. Hit her in the head and also another one that was flopping on her street uh, in the middle of, of urban Costa Rica. So go back to your original uh, speculations there and are there any additional questions that you have now additional possibilities that this makes you think of talk for I'll give you just one moment to, to add on to this <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, we're gonna we're gonna keep going here, guys. So it didn't remain a mystery forever. We did figure out what actually happened. She got out of the car, looking at the fish, feeling more freaked out than ever. You know, her worldview <laughs> has changed here with this this the appearance of these fish, right? And the, the security guard who's there at the entrance of the neighborhood sees her looking at this fish, comes over, tells her something, and she realizes what, what has happened. You know, mystery is, is over. So moving on. So, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the scientific method. No. Okay. So, you will be rewarded for your, your, your work here. Right? So I want to talk just for a moment about the scientific method. Right? And when we think about the scientific method, we think sometimes about laboratories and all these things, uh, all these artifacts of science. But um, it's really just a way of thinking right? that we engage in. When we encounter something that we don't know, we encounter the unknown, and that we are bothered to be curious about this gap in our knowledge. And that we propose our hypotheses about what's going on and seek to prove or disprove those hypotheses. And by hypothesis, we just mean the possibility, right? And seeking to, to prove or disprove, that means asking questions and trying to find the answer to those questions. So if I think this is true, what else would have to be true? Um, and how can I find out? And that's experimentation, right? And after that, we can either reject our hypothesis because it doesn't fit, we can revise it, or we can tentatively accept it um, as true so far, right? Um, and so, like I said, it's, it's not just what scientists do in laboratories, but it's what we can also do in our classrooms and in our daily lives. And it all starts with being curious and being bothered enough to take that first step of, of being puzzled about something and wanting to do something about that, right? So curiosity is a strong desire to know or, or to learn something. And it's so strong in us, in humans, that it's, it's been described as one of our primary drives as human beings, right? That we're driven to seek out curious experiences and to resolve things that are, are curious to us. Um, and some theories say that it's this incongruity avoidance that we're trying to do. That when we encounter something unknown, it creates an imbalance, you know, and we're trying to seek homeostasis. So by finding the answers to these questions, we're returning to this balance. Um, and other theories say that it's not just seeking balance, but we're actually seeking stimulation. And that even when we're in a situation in which we haven't encountered anything unknown and nothing is imbalance, uh, we're bored, and we are aroused by uh, curiosity, and we will seek out things that will make us curious. We've all done that. We're bored, we start doing stuff until something is interesting, right? Uh, and we're constantly seeking this optimal state of arousal, right? Not too aroused that we're confused and frustrated, nor bored um, by what's going on. Um, and of course, we have these reward pathways in our brain, right, that when we uh, have this novel stimulation and, and we get answers to our questions and even the act of seeking these questions that releases that feel-good juice in our brain, right, that we love. But either way, whatever it is, whatever the mechanism is, curiosity is a, a major driver of what we do as humans and, and it's a major part of the learning process, right? And curiosity is just the first step in, in, in being a critical thinker, right? bothering to be curious. I have this huge definition, which I love, but I also hate because it's so dense, okay? So I want a good reader, Matt, a good reader, to read this out loud if you don't mind. Critical thinking is the intellectual discipline process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and or evaluating information gathered from or generated by observation, experience, reflection, Reasoning or communication as a guide to belief and action. It's this. It's thick. All right. 
take a moment just in silence, okay, for about 20 or 30 seconds. I want you to read it. And what's one or two things that stand out? It's, I'm going to go through it and tell you what stands out to me. So take a moment in silence to, to read this. What are phrases and words that really pop out at you? much all at once. We need, we need like a graphic organizer for this. But they, they mentioned that this is an intellectually disciplined process, right? That we actually need to stop and think about what we're doing and, and follow a process here. And the idea is that we're processing information at all different levels, right? You heard words like synthesizing, evaluating, and all these things. Heard those somewhere before, right? So we're doing all these levels of processing of information that we've either gathered or generated um, as a result of observation, experience, or reflection, or communication, or reasoning, all those other things that they said. And finally, the most important thing, as a guide to our beliefs and actions. Right? So it's not merely to think, but to have your thinking be a guide to your actions right? and your beliefs. So moving from curious to critical, curious is just the first step, right? Wanting to know something. Um, and I really like to think about critical thinking not as a destination. We want our students to be critical thinkers in the, thinkers in the future, but the critical thinking is a way of orienting ourselves in the world, of traveling through this life, right? It's a guide to our beliefs and actions, and that um, is mostly driven primarily by our, our curiosity and our ability to um, be to inquire and seek answers to the questions that we pose ourselves, right? So, you were patient. <laughs> Any thoughts about what might have been going on here with this fish? Raining fish. Raining fish. <laughs> Maybe so, it's a truck that carries fish from that area and happens to be a little bit messy and the truck is just going away. Good guess. <laughs> birds. Bird of prey. Birds? How did I know that was going to say birds? <laughs> <laughs> it was a bird. Okay? And the fish, this African fish, is a tilapia. Tilapia is a common fish that we eat, right? But uh, those are originally from Africa. And they've since gone all over the world in, in different fish farms and things like that. So it turns out, just behind the neighborhood, just behind this big fence that you can't see, there's a little property, and the man over there has a little tilapia pond. And there are these big birds that occasionally come and try to steal the tilapias. But they're pretty big too, and sometimes they're feisty, and they flip. Out, they get out of the, the beak and they fall down, and one of them happens to be a weapon on the head. So, pretty cool story, and I hope I made you curious. And what you've done, whether you knew it or not, was engage in uh, the scientific method by bothering to be curious about something you weren't, you didn't know, posing hypotheses. You didn't really seek to disprove them because we didn't have a chance to really get out of the classroom. Um, but if you had done that, that would be your experimentation, and then you could then reflect on your original hypotheses and reject them, change them, or accept them. So um, we're moving on to the, the main portion of, of the class, of the class, whatever it is. <laughs> and I want to do a little <laughs> demo sequence uh, just of a lesson. I've never taught this lesson, but it's just a kind of ideal, interesting lesson. Um, and then I want you to think about it in terms of critical thinking. All right, so I'm going to ask you guys to play along a little bit, but mostly I'm going to have to ask you to just compress and then just hear me talk out what you guys would do with this work real fast. Okay. So let's get started. Let's imagine that I just told you my friend's fish story, and your curiosity is peaked, and we move on to talking about animals and, and, and habitats and things like that. Take a moment um, with the person next to you. Think about the swamp, right? What creatures live in the swamp, and who eats who, all right? Think about that for a second, uh, for, your, for a second, um, with your partner. Who are the predators? Who are the prey? What are the relationships between the animals in a swamp? Thank <laughs> you. 
famous swamp here in the United States, like uh, the Everglades, right? You know who, who's the, the top dog uh, these days? Not the alligator anymore. It's the snake, right? These Burmese pythons that have been uh, have infested the, the, the Everglades, right? These are an invasive species, right? Just like the African fish, the tilapia is not native to Costa Rica, these uh, snakes are not native to, to southern Florida, but they're there, and they're breeding, they're huge, and they are competing directly with alligators. Right. Really interesting. Um, so, with the person next to you, think, again, I'm going to give you just one minute so we can press this. Talk to your partner um, about uh, how are invasive species introduced into new habitats? What are some ways you think that can happen? Uh, what damage can they cause? What are some possible solutions? And then finally, what questions do you have about invasive species? What are you curious about regarding this topic? Take a moment with your partner. Okay, I'm going to move us on, guys. I'm sorry. Um, and what we would do next, we would talk more about invasive species, and we would eventually get to some point where we're going to do some main tasks together as students, right? And you, as students, are going to be biologists, and you're going to undertake uh, an ecological survey of the West River. Locals, okay, this, is, this is not a real map of the West River. Um, just uh, disclaimer, this, this right? What you're going to actually be doing is looking at three tributaries of the West River. And you're going to be looking at the species of fish that live there, their interrelationships, and uh, basically uh, do a survey of, of what populations you find and what they're doing. Okay? Here are the four fish species that you're going to be looking for. All totally real names that were not invented by your teacher. And the uh, way that you're going to do this is you're going to play a little game, a little simulation. Okay? And we would do this in real game class together, but there's no time, so I film what this would look like. Okay? And you're doing a little simulation where you know that some fish, fish eat other fish. Right? There's a food chain, there's an interrelationship between the species. Some eat others, some are eaten by others, and all these things. So as you're going to the different tributaries and looking what's going on, you are carrying out these little simulations here. Okay? For each, you're going to see every student has a block, a colored block, and that represents one of the species. And each student was given a specific set of instructions of how to interact with uh, the other species. So I just want you to watch and then tell your partner what you think is going on. So this is the first tributary that you visit in your survey. Talk with your partner, what did you see going on in this ecosystem? Uh, 
Uh, what do you think was going on? Okay, so moving on. Sorry. So what was happening is that the, the species were interacting. Some species were eating other species. Some were being eaten by other species. They were also reproducing. Right? So we had this whole interaction going on there. Then you went to another uh, tributary and you saw other behaviors. And finally, you went to a third tributary. Let's imagine as good as she did this. Um, but there was another species there that played by different rules. And we're going to see how that simulation uh, carries out. Draw some diagrams in our little your little squares that you have there to describe the relationships between the species, right, in a visual form, and then maybe a, a little description here. Right? So as as you know, partners or small groups, you guys would do that after having carried out the simulation. Okay, we're gonna move on. And because you're curious and you're good researchers, you decide to look into the literature to find out more about invasive species and see how that can shed new light on this invasive species in the West River, tributary number three, right? And so what you have uh, on your paper is a little jigsaw. So you have a little reading about an invasive species in the world. Come on, just flip it over. There you go. And uh, you also have space uh, to learn about three other invasive species. So maybe just time sake, what you can do is just kind of skim yours and then just quickly retell um, the most important things that you learn to the person next to you. Specifically regarding uh, the species' original territory, where it lives now, how it was introduced, and some of the problems and attempted solutions. So just I'll give you like two minutes to kind of skim and then just say something about your species. I'm 
Okay, <laughs> so the, the teacher in me wants you to keep talking, but the presenter in me is starting to sweat because there's about eight minutes left. So I'm going to have us, uh, I'm just going to walk you through the rest of it, guys. So after reading, after sharing with different people, learning about other invasive species, you decide to then uh, explain you know, what, uh, to the public what you think they should know about invasive species, right? Maybe what are some solutions to this Bolivian snake and fish and, and tributary treatment? Um, what can you do about that? And what, what should the public know about invasive species, about how they can be introduced into a new habitat, problems that they can cause, and things like that. So you'll create a little presentation or something like that. Some can even ask there as well. So anyway, let's take a moment just to kind of think about that little sequence that we went through, from storytelling about a fish hitting my friend in the head, to where we are right now. Just give me 30 seconds because my time is really limited. What did you do? What, what, what was the sequence of activity? What did you, what did you do as students, if you really were students in the class? Not Okay, and just so <laughs> I can keep annoying you by interrupting, uh, just so I can get a chance to, to come to the conclusion here. What, what we just did a, a little demo here, and it really represents a lot of the way that I like to think about planning a, a class, especially if I have classes, communicative focus class, and then I have time to actually develop uh, these kind of activities. The way that I like to think of it is how can I generate curiosity in students from the beginning and then try to sustain that through the end of the, the learning experience. And one way that has helped me think about this is a, a framework that, uh, again, it helps me organize my ideas. This idea of generating curiosity is, as a way of eventually leading us to, to question things and, and generate new knowledge, okay? So I call it CHART, just as an easy way to, to remember it, C-H-A-R-T, and those then curiosity, hypothesis, activity, reflection, and takeaways. So we start by trying to generate the initial curiosity among our students about the topic, about the theme of the, of the lesson, um, in order to, to stimulate engagement in these students' thinking and questioning. Help them generate their initial hypotheses, although that sounds like a very scientific word. It's just, what do they already think about a topic? What are they not sure about? What are they interested in knowing more about? What possibilities can they think of regarding the topic? And those will be explored through the whole lesson. Um, the main thing is, what are the class activities that I can design that are going to help students experience the topic in meaningful ways, in new ways that they haven't thought about before, and that this experience will serve then as a point of reflection um, at the end of the class. So how can I have students reflect on what they've done in the experience, what new things they're thinking about now as a result of the experience, and even have them revisit their initial hypotheses see how their thoughts may have changed, may have deepened, or not, that's also a possibility, uh, as a result of the experience, and then how can I get them to articulate their takeaways? In other words, again, how have their thoughts changed, deepened, um, grown, new questions emerged as a result of the experience and reflecting on the experience, right? So I encourage you to look at the bottom of that, well, the next page, whatever it is, third side, the front of the first page, and you have uh, the, the chart that I just explained. And on the bottom, uh, I have a little homework task for you, so you won't have time to do any class. What you see there is this idea of curiosity and hypotheses, and this big section of activities, and then reflection and takeaways. So think about, choose one of these as you go on, uh, a theme and a task, and think, okay, if this is the main task, students are experiencing in the classroom. What might I do at the beginning to generate their initial curiosity and help them articulate their initial 
uh, hypotheses or points of, uh, of interest and questions before getting started. And what might I do at the end of the lesson uh, to reflect on their experience and be able to talk about new ways of thinking, new points of curiosity um, as a result of this experience. So I'm going to have to leave that for homework. But just to kind of come to a close here, what's the big deal? Why, why am I talking about critical thinking? Why am I talking about reflection and curiosity and all of that in, in the context of English language teaching? I think it, it values learners in a holistic way. It's not just what you know linguistically um, that you're able to use and leverage in these class activities, but it's taking into consideration your curiosity, your thoughts, you as a, a grown adult individual who's rational. Uh, it also is um, a way of contributing to student autonomy. If they're able to think for themselves, pose their own questions and seek to answer those, they're more autonomous. It's a 21st century skill that's applicable and you know, transferable to real life. It's a 20th century skill, it's a 19th century skill, it's a caveman skill, it's a human skill um, that we need to cultivate in our students and not just um, so that they can use it in the future, but that they can use it in the classroom as well. Um, and that, of course, critical thinkers are better learners, which means they're better language learners, right? There's a lot of language learning that involves making connections that are not explicit and testing hypotheses and things like that. And finally, in the, in the context of a, a communicative language classroom, when you're engaged with something that you're curious about, your attention is going to be on the meaning of what's interesting about that and what you want to express about that, rather than surface level focus on, on, on form and language, right? And of course, you need language to do all of this, right? So I just want to make one more connection here. And one other thing that really helps me when designing lessons like this is really tying in the theme of the lesson. And not having a theme, we have a, a textbook, and yes, the theme is travel, and then all the things are grammar-related stuff, right? Um, the theme is not just the garnish on the plate. The theme is the, that was the main school, right? Um, people aren't in the classroom to learn about the present perfect and be curious about the present perfect. I mean, they are, but that's not what sustains their interest in the, in the, in the classroom, right? It's what am I curious about in this topic that I want to explore and that I want to talk about. And through that, I'll have to use the language. And you're the language teachers, right? You know how you can uh, scaffold language input and give them the language they need in order to participate in classroom activities, right? So I'm not saying that this idea of chart is a, a lesson planning sequence that you have to follow. It's more of a kind of meta framework for thinking about how I can include points in the classroom that will generate curiosity and sustain curiosity and, and, and get inquiry throughout the learning experience. And it really kind of ties everything together. Again, thinking about the theme. So if you have your own lesson planning sequence, I always introduce the vocabulary, then I do some kind of practice, and then we do some kind of fluency thing. Whatever your sequence is, you, you know your students and you know how many you work with the language, right? But this chart framework is a way of kind of putting another light, another lens of, okay, how can I really make connections with the theme all the way through, um, and then tie in at different points what language they might need and might be able to use, or reflect on an experience and think, you didn't use this language, but here's some language that could have helped you um, do this a little bit better, right? So again, you guys are the language teaching experts, you know about that. What I'm really interested in is, is, is that the thinking process and the student engagement and curiosity uh, regarding the thinking. So really quickly, i got like a minute here. There are barriers to implementing critical thinking and really focusing on curiosity in the classroom. I'm an agricultural, educational system related, um, and we know all about those. And the only thing I can say is uh, cultivate a sense of curiosity. That's the only way to really get the ball rolling, um, especially when things are not in your favor. We also have cognitive barriers, right? It, it, if you're working with young learners, people that are still developing their cognitive apparatus, right? We need uh, to give them the support that they need as well. And that is you know, scaffolding activities, providing ways of organizing information so that I can keep my information organized and then use it and not, I'm not overburdened cognitively. Um, giving them question stems, generic stems that help them generate their own unique questions about the topic. There are linguistic barriers, of course, and that's, that's where your, your, your expertise comes into play, right? Um, giving them the support language that they need, um, sentence frames, whatever it happens to be, if you want to free teach certain things, it's what you guys know all about that. Um, and then there's time. And the other thing I can say is that you don't need to think about next Friday I'm going to teach my critical thinking curiosity lesson, right? It should be a theme that uh, makes its way through all of the things we do in the classroom, make an ever present speculation in the classroom. So just to you know give you some extra homework, think about your own takeaways <laughs> from this session 
I hope I at least got you, uh, your curiosity kind of awakened. Uh, and uh, think about that moving forward. If you want to look back at those original questions, if anything new stands out to you, you can do that. And just um, as a final remark, I'm thinking more and more about my role as a teacher in the classroom. And I used this phrase several times this, this summer, and I, I think it's true. Like, I really feel that my role is to be a curator of learning experiences for students, not a transmitter of knowledge. And just because I'm a language nerd, I started thinking, curator, cur curia. I wonder if they're related. Curiosity, curator, and they are. They're both Latin, and they come from the Latin root, cura, which means to care or to care for. So how interesting is that? <laughs> care to be curious. <laughs> Thank you. Classroom. Uh, so, if everybody stands up, and if you have something 